Well, this morning we're going to be looking at Isaiah 65 and 66 as we close out our time in the prophet. Uh, next week, we'll start a new quarter, uh, which will look at Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And if you haven't picked up your book, they're down in the front pews of the wings down here. But uh, go ahead and pick one up. And if you need one uh, brought to you, let me know, and I'll be glad to do that as well. Uh, but again, today we're going to close out Isaiah with 65 and 66. And as we do so, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, you have provided for us your holy and perfect word. And dear God, we ask in your mercy as you send your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds to receive your truth. Dear God, that we will uh, listen to what it is you have to tell us today. And dear God, that we would again apply these words unto our hearts. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, you know, Isaiah is one of those books that you could probably read a million times. And every time you went back to it, you'd find something find something you hadn't seen either before or had uh, forgotten about in some way. And Isaiah 65 and 66 uh, in, uh, you know, kind of operate as summaries for everything that has taken place before. You know, the previous 64 chapters are kind of summarized here in the last two. And, of course, Isaiah had that in mind when he closed out his prophecy through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that he's doing in these two chapters is he wants to leave the people of God with hope, with comfort, with assurance that no matter how bad things are going to get, the reality is, is that God wins in the end and God's people win in the end. Now, the uh, kind of the ultimate expression of these two chapters is in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Isaiah talks about the new heavens and the new earth in Isaiah 66, he's not talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. He's talking about the first coming of Jesus Christ. And we'll get into why that is and what he means by that. But again, the point is that for the Jews who are receiving this prophecy for the first time, the immediate application is the return from exile from Babylon. The reestablishment of worship in Jerusalem, the rebuilding of the walls and the temple that we see in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, those are the kinds of things that Isaiah has in mind for the audience that are hearing him actually say these words and read those words. But again, we are not that audience, right? We don't live in you know, the 8th century, right? We live in the 21st century. And so it's helpful for us, again, to think about what the Holy Spirit is doing in giving us Isaiah 65 and 66 today, February 28th, 2021. And for us, when we read these words, as Isaiah starts in chapter 65, I was sought by those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that was not called by my name. Now, one of the messages of the book of Isaiah is that the promises that were given to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob are not just for the Jews, but they're going to be for the Gentiles as well. Now, one of the ways we see this in the Old Testament is when the Jews go to exile to Babylon, what happens to the king of Babylon? to Nebuchadnezzar. Well, he's converted, right? He comes to faith in Jehovah. He's humbled by Jehovah. And when he's humbled by Jehovah and made to crawl on the ground like an animal and eat the grass and all those things, we see in Daniel chapter 4 that he recognizes that the gods of Babylon are false and the God of Judah is real. And he professes that faith. And when we go to heaven, Nebuchadnezzar is going to be there. He's going to be standing you know, in the streets of gold with other faithful saints. And the, the conversion of Nebuchadnezzar is uh, kind of like a first fruit, right? A first taste 
of what the new covenant, the new heavens and earth are going to look like. And Isaiah 65, again, is establishing this. I was sought by those who did not ask for me. Now, the Jews, what did they ask for? For a redeemer, right? For uh, Jehovah to help them, right? The Jews went to the temple, offered sacrifices for forgiveness of sin, right? They prayed to God that he would remove the enemies of Israel from before them. But in the days of Isaiah, who is not asking for Jehovah's help? Everybody else, right? You know, the... Uh, our forefather, my forefathers in the, the southwestern part of Germany in the 8th century BC were not asking for Jehovah's help, right? Who were they asking help for, from? <laughs> right? From whoever it is they'd made into a god. Yeah, they, whatever, you know, they, they didn't follow the Norse gods like Odin and all that kind of stuff. They had their own kind of tribal gods, right? But they weren't seeking Jehovah. But what did Jehovah have in mind for my whatever great-grandparents in 8th century B.C.? That he would bring a Messiah for their descendants, right? Their descendants would come to faith in Jehovah, in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? I was sought by those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. Now, we also see this in the ministry of the church. You know, the whole point of evangelism is to go out and to tell people about Jesus. I, I haven't done this here for various reasons, but I used to do street preaching in Pittsburgh. And I can guarantee you when you're on the campus, the University of Pittsburgh, standing on a box, those people do not want to hear <laughs> what it is you have to say, right? They were not seeking the Lord. Now, you know, some of the people that, you know, heard us street preaching, you know, came and got little Gospels of John or whatever, right? They received the word, but they didn't get up that morning with the intention of going and seeing the crazy looking, you know, street preacher on the campus, right? But God in his providence brought them to that point, right? And that's the way all evangelism works, right? That's what the Great Commission is. It's the goal is to go out unto the world, to proclaim Christ and crucified, and to bring the word to people who are not seeking him, right? And that's the message here of Isaiah 65. Again, is that this calling is going to happen. I was sought by those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation who is not called by my name. I have stretched out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good according to their own thoughts, a people who provoke me to anger continually to my face, who sacrifice in gardens and burn incense on altars of brick, who sit among the graves and spend the night in the tombs, who eat swine's flesh, and the broth of balm of things is in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am holier than you. These are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all the day. Now, there's a, a sense in which this applies to Israel too, right? You know, what's Israel and Judah been doing for the last couple centuries? They've been in rebellion against Jehovah, right? You know, they have been sacrificing animals to Baal. Right? They've been throwing their children into the ovens of Molech. They have been seeking Ashtaroth and the gods and the nations surrounding them. But notice what is said here in this. I have stretched out my hands all day long to rebellious people. Now, think about this imagery of stretching out hands. What do you think Isaiah is trying to say about God in this image? He's reaching out to them. Right, he's reaching out to them. Even though they're rebellious, even though they have kicked against the goads, even though they have sacrificed to false gods, what is God doing for his covenant people? 
Right? He's reaching out to them. Now, in a sense, how has God been reaching out to his covenant people, even though they're in rebellion? Right, through the prophets. Right? He's been sending men like Isaiah, you know, like Hosea, like, like uh, you know, Zechariah. He's been sending them to the people. But what have the people been doing to the Lord's prophets? Killing them, right? You know, you, know, you know, remember the parable that, you know, there's two parables that are, are similar to this, but you're at the parable of the vineyard, right? You, know, you remember there that, that God is sent, keeps sending people, and what do they do to the people who come to the vineyard? Right? They kill them, right? And eventually, who does the owner of the vineyard send? His son. And what do they do to his son? Kill him, right? And of course, you know, who is the son of the, of the vineyard owner? Jesus, right? He is the one that he has sent. And of course, you know, they, they even kill him. But again, it's the nature of who our God is, right? He's a God of mercy, right? He's a God of love. He's a God of grace. And so he continually sends these prophets and send these men, sends his word to a rebellious people and... Again, this is a testimony to who God is, right? That he will continually send out these messages of hope and, 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 and uh, uh, justice and judgment upon the people. And he's never going to stop. He's always going to send out these messengers. Now, you know, a couple other things we see here mentioned about uh, the rebellious people is the fact that they walk in a way that is not good according to their own thoughts. Now, that obviously applies to what we talked about last week in Ephesians chapter 4, right? You know, what was wrong with the Gentiles? They walk in the futility of their mind. Right? And what, what is you know, futile? What does it mean to be for something to be futile? With no purpose, right? You know, it has no end. It has no goal. It has no, uh, you know, victory on the horizon. Right? It's a futile act. And this is the way in which the rebellious people are walking. They are walking in a way that is not good according to their own thoughts. Okay? A people who provoke me to anger to continue my face, who sacrifice in gardens and burn incense on altars of brick, who sit among the graves and spend the night in the tombs, who eat swine's flesh. Now, what's wrong with eating swine's flesh? <laughs> right? Well, it, what's that? <laughs> well, then, yeah. yeah. Well, the Jews aren't supposed to eat swine's flesh, are they? Right? That's they are banned from eating pork. Uh, you know, that's you know. Uh, I assume they're in the grocery stores here, but I never look at anything other than store brand. Uh, products, but uh, you know Nathan's hot dogs. You know, you ever seen Nathan's hot dogs? They have a, uh, or not Nathan's hot dog, Hebrew National, uh, Hebrew National hot dogs, right? What do they say underneath? Yeah, you know, right. We answer to a higher power, and they're all beef hot dogs, right? And, and why would Hebrew National be all beef hot dogs? Because what's usually in hot dogs? <laughs> Everything, right? <laughs> Whatever's left over, right? And um, uh, yeah, that's what that old saying. You, know, you don't want to. You don't want to see how the sausage is made. Uh, yeah, that that kind of thing, right? But eating of, of swine flesh is a direct rebellious act against Jehovah by the Jews, right? Because he has told them explicitly not to do that. And the broth of all the things is in their vessels, who say, "Keep to yourself. Do not come near me." Now, again, rebellious people don't want to be called out in their sin, do they? Right. We, why do rebellious people not want to be called out in their sin? Pride. Right. That's right. They don't want to be brought under the light, right? They don't want to you know, be, be, because what do they know deep down? That they're wrong. That they're wrong, right? You know, and that's, that's where your know, pride comes in, right? None of us like being confronted in our sin, do we? We don't, we don't enjoy the process of being called out when we're wrong. Um, 
And, and, and what happens when you double down on doing something that's wrong? Whether you're at work or whatever. It just makes it worse, right? right? And again, that's exactly what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 1, right? They suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And as they're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, God gives them over right, to the lusts of their heart. And so the effects of their rebellion get even worse and worse. Now, as Isaiah is bringing this forth, again, as I said, this is a summary of everything that's come before in the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah began the first 12 chapters or so testifying to the sins of Israel and of Judah. And all of these things were illustrated in the kings of Israel and Judah. You know, the you know, you know, one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible is when Jehoshaphat and Ahab are sitting there and Jehoshaphat says, well, why don't we go talk to a, a, a prophet, right? And, and what does Ahab say about Jehovah wanting to talk to a prophet? So yeah, I don't want to talk to those guys. Every time I do, they tell me I'm doing something wrong, right? I want a yes man. I want you to go get me a prophet who's going to only prophesy good things to me. Right? And <laughs> I... I always imagine Jehoshaphat sitting there, you know, and the, and the Bible gives us a little bit of witness to this. Jehoshaphat kind of looks at Ahab like he's crazy. Like, what are you talking about? You only want a prophet who's going to say good things. That's not what prophets do, right? But what does the apostle Paul warn Timothy about is going to be uh, something he's going to have to deal with. Right? He's going to have to deal with people who want to have their ears tickled, Right? who gather around them teachers who basically do exactly what Ahab does, right? You know, gather around them teachers who will not call them out on their sin, will not say anything bad towards them, you know, who, who basically just kind of preach a TED Talk every Sunday. Um, you know, here's how to live your life better. Here's some, you know, living tips, things like that. But that's not, again, what the job of a prophet is, is it? What's the job of a prophet? First and foremost. Right? Do it, say exactly what God has told you to say. Now, it, do prophets always say bad things? No. Right? Prophets have good things to say too. Right? And that's, again, part of this whole message of Isaiah 65 and 66 is that Israel, look, this is the situation. You have been in gross idolatrous sin for generations at this point. But remember, again, that the Lord has not forgotten you, even in the midst of all these things. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silence, but will repay, even repay into their bosom your iniquities, the iniquities of your fathers together, says the Lord, who have burned incense on the mountains and blasphemed me on the hills. Therefore, I measure their former work into their bosom. Now, the, these initially don't sound like words of hope. But why are these words, words of hope, that God will uh, uh, gather the iniquities of yourself and your fathers together? Why, why is that a word of hope? Right, he has a plan to redeem, right? That's part of the message of the gospel, right? That God has taken all of our sin, right, and gathered it together. Right? He's bundled it together. He's made it one. And what has God done with our sin? Right? Put it on Jesus, right? He has placed it on his son. Right? The wrath of God has been poured out upon Jesus Christ. And God's justice is a, me is a message of hope for us. That God has a plan to deal with with the iniquity of Israel and of Judah. Now, initially, right, what is the consequence for Judah's sin? Right, what's going to happen to them? Right, they're going to get carried away into exile. But when God carries them away into exile, what does he tell them through the prophets? He's going to bring them back, right? And that's, that's, what, that's one of the things that enables Daniel to live faithfully in the land of Babylon, is he knows and has the promise of the prophets that they're not going to be in Babylon forever. 
that God will bring them home. In fact, Daniel is told in Daniel chapter 1, verse 21, uh, that he will see the day of Cyrus. Now, we didn't cover this chapter, but what does Isaiah say about Cyrus? That Cyrus is the Lord's anointed, and that Cyrus is going to bring the people back to bond, from bondage into the land. And Cyrus is going to bless them. In fact, that's exactly what Cyrus does, right? He releases them from bondage, and he doesn't just send them home, but he sends them home with parting gifts, right? He sends them home with, uh, with stone and with wood and with masons to rebuild the temple. And what does Judah do with all the resources that Cyrus gives them? <laughs> rebuild their own houses, right? right? That's the whole message of the prophet Haggai. Hey, numbskulls, God has blessed you, and what have you done with that blessing? Right? You've used it for yourself, right? You've not put the Lord first. And then, of course, that's a message that we need to hear, right? You know, the Lord has blessed us immensely, more than we can ever comprehend, in Jesus Christ. But what does Paul warn the uh, Romans in Romans chapter 6 about the grace of God? What's the temptation? Right? To use the grace of God as a license to sin. Right? Shall we sin that grace might abound? And what does Paul say in response to that? May it never be, right? That's one of those cases where the, the, the Greek is much more forceful than the English. Uh, you know, Paul basically shouts there in the Greek and yells, no, that is not how this works, right? Grace given to us is to be used for what purpose? To bring glory to God, right? To to, to show forth our thanksgiving for the redemption purchased by Christ. And that's where Isaiah is going to move as he continues in uh, these, uh, th these last couple of chapters. Now, in verse 8 of Isaiah 65, it says, thus, the, thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one says, do not destroy it, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servant's sake, that I may not destroy them all. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah and heir of my mountains. My elect shall inherit it. My servant shall dwell there. Now, who is the descendant of Jacob do you think Isaiah has in mind here? You know, who is the, uh, the heir of the mountains from Judah? This is Sunday school answer time. <laughs> Jesus, right? Jesus is the heir of the mountains, right? He is you know, uh, described elsewhere as the lion of Judah, right? He is described uh, by, uh, by uh, Jacob, right? That out of Judah will come a lawgiver, right? The king is of Judah, right? So Jesus Christ is the one who is going to bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah and heir by mountains, my elect shall inherit it, and my servant shall dwell there. Okay, so a blessing is coming. Okay, Jews, Gentiles, hear this message, a blessing is coming, and it's going to come from Judah. And my elect shall inherit it. Now, you know, Presbyterians love that word, right? We love that word elect. Right? That, that's our word. <laughs> we, we own that word. And that word is being used here in the sense that we mean it when we use the word elect. Right? These are the people that Christ has said. Right? These are the people that Christ has died for. And the elect are elect not because of who they are or what they have done or anything else. But they are elect because God has chosen them. Right? And God has chosen them in Jesus Christ. Right? That's an important thing to remember whenever we talk about the elect or talk about predestination and election and that kind of thing. Right? It always, we have to be very careful that we remember that, first of all, do we know who the elect are? No. Right? Um, did Jesus know who the elect were? Yes, <laughs> he knew. 
But did Jesus, when he came to this earth, kind of walk around and grab all the elect people and take them somewhere else? No. When Jesus went out and preached, who did he preach to? Everyone, right? Because the message of the gospel and the preaching of the gospel, faithfully done, is going to do two things, right? It's going to bring in the elect. The elect are going to hear their master's voice. They're going to be converted. They're going to be redeemed by the work of the Holy Spirit. But if you are reprobate, what is the preaching of the gospel going to do to you? Like pour hot coals upon your head, right? Now, again, we don't know who those people are, right? You know, we have been called to preach the word to everyone, but also... You know, the elders of the church are given a responsibility as best as they can within, you know, the realities of human discernment. You know, when somebody comes to the elders and confesses faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, how are the elders to receive that confession? Right, with charity, right? With, you know, a... You know, with, with uh, you know, an assumption that the person is telling the truth, you know, however you want to phrase that. Now, we see that, of course, with Simon Magus. When Simon Magus came to Peter and Philip and professed faith, what did they do to him? They received him, right? But what became evident very quickly in the life of Simon Magus? <laughs> right? That he was not saved, right? Because, first of all, what doesn't happen? to Simon Magus. Right? He, right? There's no change in his life, is there? Right? He sought out the disciples because he saw the wonders and miracles they were doing and he wanted to end on that action. Right? He, he wanted the ability to do that and so when he went and asked, well, how do I do that? They said, believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, okay, I, I, yeah, that, that, I can do that. I, I'll say that. And then when the signs and wonders didn't appear, what did he do? Right, he wanted to buy them, right? He wanted to purchase the ability to do that. Now, can we purchase salvation? No, right? We cannot purchase salvation either through, you know, offerings, you know, physical money, or by good works, right? We cannot purchase salvation through merit. Any way you want to count merit, right? We cannot be saved in that way. We're only saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, only by his work. And that's, again, the message here of uh, the descendant, the heir of Judah, right? My elect shall inherit this new wine that is found in the clusters, right? The fullness, the sufficiency, they will inherit because it's in Christ. Now, there's a, in verse 11, we have a but. Right? And usually, when there's a but, it usually is not good. Right? It, it, you know, if, if you've ever been uh, uh, in a high-pressure sales environment and they're making all these kind of promises, and then towards the end of the presentation, the guy says, but there's, some, there's a catch. Right? There, there's something that maybe you didn't anticipate. Well, notice what it says in verse 11. But you are those who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain, who prepare a table for Gad, and who furnish a drink offering for men. Therefore, I will number you for the sword, and you shall all bow down to the slaughter, because when I called, you did not answer. When I spoke, you did not hear, but did evil my eyes and chose that in which I did not delight. Now, that's the reality for the reprobate, right? That's the reality for those who, are, uh, who um, uh, do not hear the voice of Christ. There is no one in the history of earth who can stand on the day of judgment and say what? I didn't know, right? I wasn't aware that you are God and I wasn't aware that I should bow down to you and worship you. In fact, what does Psalm 19 tell us? Right? The whole creation testifies that Jehovah is God and that we are to bow down and worship him. But God has also given Special revelation is the way our confession and our catechism describe it. And the preaching of the gospel is one of those, quote unquote, special revelations. Now, that doesn't mean that when I'm preaching that I'm 
saying new words of the Bible. In fact, if, you, if you're ever around a preacher who claims to speak in that way, what should you do? <laughs> Run away, right? If, if, if a preacher claims um, to be providing new revelation, yeah, in fact, what does Deuteronomy chapter 12 tell you that you should do to that fellow? Well, under the old Mosaic law, you should put him to death, right? And, and why is there such a, now I, I may not think it's draconian, but some people might. Why, why is there such a penalty to false prophecy? Lead people astray, right? In a sense, it's spiritual murder to lead people away from Jesus Christ, right? Lead people away from the preaching, uh, from the gospel itself and from the right words that God has given. And again, that's one of the reasons why, you know, in the book of Acts, you know, in Berea, we have that positive example of the people, right? After Paul gets done preaching, what do they do? Right? They searched the scriptures to see whether or not what Paul said was true. Now, what did they find? It was, right? They found that what Paul was saying was exactly what the scriptures said. Now, what scriptures were they reading? The Old Testament, right? Uh, you know, it, you know, when the Bereans were around, it wasn't like they were getting updates to the Bible, right? They didn't get, you know, the book of Mark in the mail and, you know, have it there, right? They had the Old Testament scriptures. So when Paul preached Christ and him crucified, how did they know what he was saying, right? Because not only had Isaiah prophesied of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the whole Old Testament had testified to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, what does Jesus do with the men on the road in Emmaus? And the disciples after that. Right? He goes right back to Moses and the prophets, and the Psalms, and he shows them, here's where it all testifies of me. Right? And so that's one of the reasons, again, why it's so important for us to read the Old Testament. Right? There's some people who only read the New Testament. And part of their reasoning is, is, well, the Old Testament is past and the New Testament is the New Testament, right? So that's all we really need. But what's longer? Old, <laughs> Old Testament, right? Uh, I think that's part of the reason sometimes why people don't read the Old Testament, right? Because there's a lot more there, right? It takes a lot more effort to read the book of Ezekiel than it does to read, you know, the book of Philemon, right? Not, not just because one is 25 verses and the other is, you know, the longest book in the Bible, but... Again, it's not as clear, so to speak, in Ezekiel. But how does Ezekiel become clear? What's that? Right, from the New Testament, right? You know, and so the more you read the Old Testament, the more, better you understand the New Testament, right? And the more you get to read the New Testament, the better you understand the Old Testament, right? Because... Yeah, this is one of, I've said this before, but this is one of my pet peeves with Bible publishing is that they put like three pages between Malachi and Matthew. And, you know, one of the things that that, you know, probably doesn't help is this division between the Old and New Testament. You know, this idea that they're kind of separate documents. But how does the Holy Spirit intend us to read from the end of Malachi right into the beginning of Matthew, right? Because that's a continuing revelation, right? Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, the uh, new covenant uh, and the new heavens and the new earth because that's, you know, the, the next uh, part of this, uh, you know, that Isaiah is laying out here. Now, in verse 17 of Isaiah 65, he says, For behold, I create new heavens, new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. Behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. Now, as I said at the beginning, verse 17, really through the end of the book of Isaiah, is all about the new heavens and the new earth. Now, 
just like with other parts of Isaiah 65, Isaiah 66 it has kind of a immediate application to the Jews who are hearing these words and to Christians who live on the other side of you know, the first coming of the Lord Jesus. Now, for the Jews who are hearing this, it has an immediate reference to their returning back to the land after Cyrus has come on the scene and they're returning. Right? There is a joy in the rebuilding of the temple in the days of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. You know, there's a passage there. As they're rebuilding the temple, what are the old men doing? Right? They're crying. Now, th there's, a, there's a couple senses in which they're crying. One, they are remembering the old glory of the temple. And the new temple is not as glorious as Solomon's temple. But they're also crying tears of joy. Because what did they not get to do for 70 years? Worship, right? You know, Psalm 137 tells us that they hung their harps in the trees. And part of that message is, is that in the old covenant, you couldn't just worship wherever you felt like, right? Where was the only place you were allowed to offer sacrifices to Jehovah? In the temple in Jerusalem. In fact, that's what got Jeroboam in trouble, right? Because he thought he could just set up his own temple wherever he wanted. And God said, no, that's not how that works. You have to go to Jerusalem to do that. And of course, that's the question that the woman at the well asked Jesus in John 4. Well, in this new age, in this new covenant, where are we going to worship? Are we going to worship here in Samaria or are we going to worship in Jerusalem? And what does Jesus tell her? Neither, right? Well, I mean, you can worship in Samaria if you want to. You can worship in Jerusalem if you want to. But that's not what matters, right? What matters in the new covenant when it comes to worship? Right? Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also, right? The, in the new covenant, we, wherever God's people are gathered, that is where worship takes place. Because you, you remember in the old covenant, where did God dwell? In the Holy of Holies, right? In the new covenant, where does God dwell? In, in us, right? So in a sense, we are the Holy of Holies. In fact, the, you know, the book of Hebrews says that almost word for word, right? We are the temple, right? And of course, 1 Corinthians says that as well. And that's one of the reasons why, again, we are to be holy. Because if we sin, who are we bringing into that sin? God, right? And in the Old Testament, what, was, what happened to a high priest who brought sin into the holy holies? They got struck dead, right? Now... In, in God's mercy, that doesn't happen to us, right? Because if that was true, what would, what would have happened to us a nanosecond after we came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Right? We'd be dead, right? Because even though we've been washed in the blood, even though we've been redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ, who still dwells in us? The old man, right? right? We're, our, our flesh is still weak. We are still... You know, you know, not fully sanctified yet, right? We still sin. But the reality is, is that because Jesus Christ, you know, the, the Holy Spirit dwells in us and we have a mediator between God, man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the advocate of the Father, that when we do sin, what takes place? Right, repentance, right? And Jesus Christ intercedes for us on behalf of the Father, right? And... That's part of the message here in the new heavens and the new earth, right? When it says here in verse 17 that the former things should not be remembered or come to mind, that's part of what is mentioned here. Because when we are redeemed in the blood of the Lamb, what does God no longer remember about us? Our sin, right? You know, that's what Psalm... Uh, oh, the number fell out of my brain. Um, it's either Psalm 103 or Psalm 130. I'm probably getting that wrong. Uh, the Psalm which says, you know, that I have cast it from the east as far as the east is from the west. Um, I can't, I should write things down. Um, somebody find that later and uh, 
let me know. Uh, but that, right, that's part of the message of the gospel, right? Is that our sins are cast out of his sight. And so the former things are remembered no more, nor come to mind, right? Because when God the Father looks at us, who does he see? His son, right? Because we are in his covering, right? We are wearing his garment. And so he recognizes us as his son. And we'll close on this, but you know, this is one of the, the pictures of, uh, of Joseph that is helpful. When the brothers you know, sell Joseph into slavery, what do they do with his coat of many colors? Tear it up, and what else do they do to it? They put blood all over it, right? And so when they bring it back, what does Jacob think? has happened to his son. He's dead, right? Because he looks at the garment and what does he see? He sees Joseph, right? That is his identity in Joseph, right? So when the father looks at us, right, he doesn't see, again, our blood and our death and our tearing. What does he see, right? He sees the perfect garment that has been placed on us in Jesus Christ. Now, again, we could probably spend the next year and a half going through <laughs> these two chapters, but we're going to have to close uh, on that. But um, we'll go ahead and, and uh, close the word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again uh, for the time you give to us to learn your word, to study your word. And we pray to God that you would continue to apply these truths unto our hearts. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen.